And I'd like to take a moment to introduce Dr. Heho to everyone. I think we're nearly all back, so we'll jump into that. Um, I anticipate that most of you are familiar with Dr. Heho's work to some extent, given that you are here, you signed up for this event. It's about Dr. Heho's most recent book, Saving Us. So I hope that I hope that you know where you are. Um, but for those of you who would like a little bit more information, Dr. Heho is a climate scientist and the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Her work has resulted in over 125 peer-reviewed papers, abstracts, and other publications, and many key reports, including the U.S. Global Change Research Program, Second National Climate Assessment, the U.S. National Academy of Science Report, Climate Stabilization Targets, Emissions Concentrations and Impacts, Over Decades to Millennia, and the 2014 Third National Climate Assessment. She is incredibly distinguished, and we are so honored that she has taken the time to join us here tonight. Um, Dr. Heho, would you like to say a few words of welcome? I would, once I unmute myself. Um, it's such a pleasure to join you. Um, I heard what you were discussing in the breakout groups, which is absolutely phenomenal, um, because the whole purpose of my book is to show people how who we are, our unique life experiences, our unique values, um, our, our unique identity is the perfect person to care about climate change and to connect with others who share key aspects of that identity with us. And bringing our whole self to the table, I feel is so important on an issue like climate change because it isn't only about what's happening to our world, it's about what matters and about what we can do. So we have to connect our head, which knows all the scientific information about how the planet is warming and humans are responsible, to our heart, which is why it matters to us, to our hands, which is what we can do about it and make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Hayho. And I believe Cameron spoke with you about doing a brief reading from your book. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. So I'll let you take it away. I would be happy to. So I don't have a specific passage that I always use to do readings, rather than I pick a different passage each time. And the passage that I picked actually goes really well with what you were talking about in your groups. It is at the end of chapter seven. It's the section called What Faith Can Teach Us. As a Christian myself, I find it particularly striking how the Bible talks about fear and action. And I would add that fear is so much of what we see today when people talk about climate change. In fact, some people are so panicked and full of fear about climate change that they turn on each other. I'm getting more attacks these days from people on the far left-hand side of the spectrum who are worried to death about climate change than I get from trolls on the right-hand side of the spectrum. And when we're afraid, often we just lash out against others, but that isn't what's gonna fix the problem. So in the Apostle Paul's letter to Timothy, he states simply that God has not given us a spirit of fear. So I think of this as a litmus test. If we feel fear and we respond to climate change out of fear, which can be either fear of the solutions, which people on the right-hand side of the political spectrum do, they fear the solutions and that's why they reject the science, or fear of the overwhelming nature of the impacts and anger and frustration about how nothing's changing, that fear is not coming from God. Instead, Paul continues, God has given us a spirit of power, which enables us to act. Power is kind of an old fashioned word, but I think the modern word is empowered, to be empowered, to have agency, to have the ability to act, which is the opposite of being paralyzed by fear. So God has given us a spirit of power to act instead of being frozen or paralyzed and a spirit of love to have compassion for others, which means caring for others and putting their needs first. And often when we're afraid, we put our own needs first, not those of others. And finally, my favorite part as a scientist, we've been given, gifted with a sound mind that we can make to make, use to make good decisions based on facts and data that God has given us. So how do we move beyond fear or shame or guilt? By acting from love, I believe. Love starts with speaking truth with making people fully aware of the risks and the choices that they face in a manner that is relevant and practical to them. But love also offers compassion, understanding, and acceptance, the exact opposite of guilt and shame. 
Love bolsters our courage too. What will we not do for those and that we love? And finally, love opens the door to that most ephemeral and sought after of emotions, hope. Hannah Malcolm, who's written another great book herself, an edited volume of essays and reflections on grief and despair in a warmer world. Hannah Malcolm is a theologian who grew up listening to her grandfather, who was pioneering climate scientist Sir John Houghton, who was himself a Christian. She grew up listening to him talk about the urgent problems facing humanity. Whole countries will be underwater in 50 years if we don't do something now, she recalls him saying. She sees the echo of modern scientists' warnings in the apocalyptic language of biblical prophets, warning of catastrophe if the status quo continues. But she points to a key next step. The words of the prophets, living and dead, can help us learn to talk about our apocalyptic fears. They teach us to be honest about the realities of sin, greed, and grief. They call for radical upside down changes, not small adjustments to existing systems. And they teach us how to be absurdly hopeful, painting visions of peaceful futures, even when they seem impossible. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Um, at this point in the evening, we will move into our time of Q&A. So for the audience, um, if you have a question, please put it in the chat um, and I will be watching that and I'll read it aloud to you. That way we can make sure that we don't have some chaos with everyone coming off mute at the same time, all that. Um, and if you need to expand on your question, I will ask you to come off of mute at that time to read your question aloud. Um, and to get us started, um, Dr. Hayhill, I have a question for you. So you are a climate scientist. We know that about you. Um, in your book, however, I was really struck by how much you drew on psychology, sociology, and other so social sciences. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your journey towards learning all of that and towards understanding that and towards becoming a better communicator for having these really important conversations and, and how, what was that journey like for you? So I became a climate scientist when I realized that climate change was profoundly unfair, that it affected the most vulnerable and the most marginalized people, and that we needed to incorporate it into all our decisions if we were going to end up in the right place. So I wanted to do policy relevant science, and that's why I began this career. And so back um, almost 20 years ago, which is a long time, um, very early on in my career, I was asked to participate in a regional climate impact assessment for the Great Lakes region, which is the area that I'm from. I'm from Toronto originally. And after we had prepared this assessment of how climate change was going to be affecting the Great Lakes with the Union of Concerned Scientists and the Ecological Society of America, they brought in somebody to do media training. And I was thinking, media training? Why do we need media training? Um, kind of like if you've seen that movie, Don't Look Up, where the scientists give me are offered media training, they're like, well, we don't need media training. Well, so in comes the media trainer and started to show us just how much science and how much expertise there is to good communication and just how badly wrong communication would go if we don't take into account the frames that people think within, the, the preconceptions people bring to the table, the way people understand information. It absolutely shocked me. I felt as if scales fell from my eyes. I was like, what? There's a science to this and people study this and there's actual techniques that work? Tell me more. Because the reason I'm a scientist is because, or climate scientist specifically, is because I think everybody needs to know this. And I'm wasting my time, I realized, if I am not using the best available social science to understand what people are thinking, what preconceived notions they bring to the table, how our brains absorb difficult and thorny and complex information. It's we humans, how we interact with that information, that's where the biggest challenges are. We've known since the 1960s that climate change was not only real and human caused, but that it posed a profound risk for humans, so much so that scientists formally warned a US president of the risks of climate change in 1965, as I talk about in my book. The problem is not that we don't enough, have enough science understanding the climate system. The problem is, is that we have not brought in our understanding of how we humans deal with information. And so that's why so much of my book talks about that is because if we really want to make a difference, we have to understand what's holding us back. And what's holding us back has a lot more to do with fear and guilt and shame and psychological distance 
and um, political polarization than it does with ice sheets and global temperatures. Thank you so much. I I love that story. That's excellent. Um, yeah, the, the film Don't Look Up really put a clear picture into my mind about what you're talking about. Um, I'm looking at the chat and I see a question from Kara Stephenson. Um, <laughs> yes. I see many great questions. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about Kara's question, how to talk about the sa sacrifice necessary to address the climate crisis, but in the right way. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I don't use that word. And the reason I don't use it is because so much of climate action is couched in individual sacrificial terms. Mm -hmm. And it's couched that way because many of us who are already worried about enacting on climate, that appeals to us. We have personalities where individual sacrifice is, an, is appealing to us. It's something that we want to do, that we're motivated to do, and so that's what motivated us to engage in climate action. But I have some news for you. We're in the vast min minority, mm -hmm. vast minority. And if we're trying to get everybody else to care and act for the same reason that we care and act, we're never gonna fix this problem. We have to get people to act for the reasons why they already care which could be completely different than the reasons we care. Let me give you a pretty, pretty big example. So one of the um, personal individual actions that we can do is we can, um, if we need a car, if we live in a place where public transportation is not an option, like where I live here in Texas, is to get an electric vehicle, right? So I have an electric vehicle because it doesn't produce carbon emissions and I can charge it with our solar panels. But what if somebody wants to get an electric vehicle because it goes from zero to 60 in less than two seconds? Am I going to try to convince them? No, no, no. That's the wrong reason. You don't want to get it because of that. That's the wrong reason. You have to get it because it's better. No, I don't care why they get it. I'd be like, yes. Did you know? I'm going to read you all the reviews to tell you just how fast it is. Why don't we go try it out? And you can see just how, how much you feel like vomiting when, when they accelerate because it's so fast. You know what I mean? So, so to get people to act, we have to get them to act because of the things they already care about. And most people don't react well to being told that you have to give up traveling, driving, having children, eating meat, using electricity, doing anything that you feel like makes life worthwhile. A lot of people have already processed all of that and decided if giving up everything that makes life worthwhile is the price of fixing climate change, I'd rather not. Thank you very much. I would say a much larger segment of the population has decided that than has decided to sacrifice in order to fix climate change. So does that mean all is lost? Not at all, because climate actions have so many benefits. Like, let's look at what happens if we wean ourselves off fossil fuels. We'll reduce the premature deaths from air pollution by 9 million a year. That's double the number of COVID deaths saved every single year. That's pretty good news. What happens? Again, if we get an electric vehicle, well, we don't have to go to the gas station during COVID. And I certainly like that. That was no sacrifice at all. What happens if we change our diet? We save money. We get a little more adventurous with our food. We become healthier. What's wrong with that? That's not a sacrifice. That's good news. Now, I'm not naive enough to assume that everything's going to work out like that. But, you know, in the way, for example, the way I've reduced my, my travel emissions takes a lot of work bundling all my trips. But it feels good because I get to do so much when I travel. I get to see so many different people and do so many different events in one place. I feel very grounded in that place. And I actually prefer bundling my travel now, even if I traveled on completely carbon neutral airplanes, I would still bundle. So when we talk about what we have to do to fix climate change, I try to especially begin with the positive benefits of doing what we're doing. And sometimes those positive benefits are just feeling good about the fact that we're doing something right, that we're getting rid of plastic in the bathroom or that we're you know, taking our, our um, reusable bags to the grocery store. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel like, hey, I'm doing the right thing. And when we talk about the changes that are needed as a society, we are talking about energy sources that never run out on us, that do not pollute, that are going to be cheaper. In fact, many of them are already cheaper. We're talking about making food more accessible, reducing food waste so more people have food and less go hungry, improving water quality, making people's homes and cities safer. We're talking about an amazing amount of good stuff. In fact, one of the most hopeful books I've read was written by Christiana Figueres. 
After she successfully negotiated the Paris Agreement in 2015, she sat down and she wrote a book called The Future We Choose. And in it, she envisioned what 2030 would look like if we tackled climate change. And now if a lot of climate people had written that book, they would have been like, well, in 2030, nobody does this and nobody eats that and nobody goes here and nobody does anything. And it's just basically, we go back to living in a cave, looking at our fingernails because we've given them everything. Well, that's not the book she wrote. She wrote a book envisioning vibrant, walkable, healthy cities, connected communities, incredible quality of life where we're connected with people, we're connected with nature, our health is improved, the quality of our life is improved. There truly are so many benefits to climate action that I think really emphasizing those, especially with the focus on what matters to whoever it is you're talking to, that's the way to get people on board with this, it really is. And if sacrifice is what appeals to them, then by all means, let's talk about the sacrifice. But if not, talk about something that does appeal to them. I love that. Um, that's such a helpful framework for thinking about our solutions and our future. And like, we really are looking for solutions to the climate crisis. We're not looking for sacrifices for the climate crisis. That's, that's very helpful for me. And I'm going to start thinking that way. And I appreciate that. Um, yes. Uh, we're yeah. looking for a better future. Right, we really are. And it doesn't have to look grim and it doesn't have to look like you give up a whole lot. It just looks like doing things differently. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Let me actually just answer here because I see a couple. Yeah, go for it. I wanted to tell you all something really exciting. And that is that I have been preparing discussion questions, short videos, and class activities and an annotated reading list of essays and journal articles to go with Saving Us. It was all supposed to be online this week, but the entire family got COVID and I got the flu on top of COVID. So I had COVID and the flu. So I'm actually like taking cough medicine here and eating honey so I can still talk to you tonight. So that's why that's not already online on my website. My website, just my name, katherinehayhoe.com and I'll put it in the chat here. But next week, in fact, by the end of this week, my goal is to have all of that online. So if you want to lead a book discussion group online or in person in a classroom in your neighborhood or in a church, I think I might have some questions that are specifically more for faith-based audiences, but then questions that are just more for general audiences. You're gonna have all the questions there. We're gonna have a short video for every section. So you could watch like a little 10 minute video of me talking about that section of the book. And if you're using it in classrooms, I'm gonna have an activity to go with each section of the book that you can do. And I'm going to have, like I said, an annotated reading list. So if you're using it for, you know, uh, at the university level or maybe for seniors in high school and you want some more in-depth reading, like you want to read, you know, the original Six Americas of Global Warming Study or you want to read, you know, the essay that I'm talking about, but the whole essay, not just the part I put in the book, I'm going to have a whole list of that as well. That's incredible. And yes, there was quite a few questions about that. So I'm glad that, that we jumped on that. Yeah. <laughs> People want to dig in more. They want to share this. So that's, that's awesome. Wonderful. I love it. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many more good questions, but unfortunately, I think we only have time for maybe one or two more. So I'll start with um, any advice for a pastor and the post person who posted this, Ben, says me who wants to preach on the subject but has all six Americas in the pews or just for public speakers in general who might not know what their audience is like or might have a very mixed audience. Mm-hmm. So sometimes when I have a mixed audience, I actually get them to do the short three question six Americas test. Um, and I use poll everywhere to collect their answers to just see who they are, because I'm kind of curious or sometimes I ask them questions ahead of time. But I, I do have a recommendation. And if you want to watch, here's a sermon I gave um, at a big evangelical church in Canada just before COVID closed everything down. And it was definitely an audience that had the full six Americas from across the entire spectrum. Uh, so if you wanna see how I do that, that's an, an example. And in a nutshell, always begin with something that your audience and you agree on. So, uh, so always begin with, um, I always you know, begin with, you know, what does the Bible say about this and this? And we all agree on that. Okay, so then how does this connect to what we're seeing today? And how do we respond? And then I go back to the Bible for how we respond. So I always make sure to ground what I'm talking about in things that whoever I'm talking with would agree with me on. And you don't just have to do it, um, or you can't just, you don't, you, it isn't limited to the Bible. You can obviously do it with whatever religious text you're speaking to, whatever group you're speaking to. 
But in my book, I also talk about how I did it with the Rotary Club using the four-way test because they all agree on that. Um, and I've done it with many other things as well. Now, if you want to see how I would speak to an audience that is definitely more to one side of the six Americas, specifically the more cautious and doubtful side, then let me give you a different link to a talk that I gave virtually during COVID at Southeastern Baptist Seminary. That was definitely sort of more to one side of the audience. <clears throat> Let's see. Stern, uh, just, um, let me see if I can find the link here. And while I'm doing that, why don't you pick the next question to ask me? Yeah, um, I was actually going to ask you, I see a question from John Willis talking, a question about talking with people who do lean more conservative and who feel very, a strong allegiance to conservative policy. Um, so when we talk about climate change, we obviously want to talk about it, we want to find common ground, but our solutions are often rooted in policy. So um, how would you have a conversation about that that leads through the weeds of policy with people who might disagree with you politically? Well, here's the interesting thing. According to the Yale Program on Climate Communication, which I would assume you're all pretty familiar with, um, when the Green New Deal first came out, it had about 65% support from Republicans. And over time, what happened? Democrats stayed about the same and Republicans tanked. Why did Republicans tank? Did the Green New Deal change? No. What changed? The messaging about it. It was all over conservative news outlets, people panning it. So if you asked a lot of Republicans, you know, do you support the Green New Deal today? Most of them would say no. But then you would say, what is it? And they'd say, well, it's this thing that AOC proposed. It's this radical communist agenda. And you'd be like, well, what's actually in it? And they'd be like, I have no clue. <laughs> so try to avoid the labels, but rather talk about what's actually in policy. Like, hey, won't you think it's a good idea to do blah, blah, blah? Or I'm really worried about blah, blah, blah. What if the government did blah, blah, blah? Talk about the actual solution rather than the label that's put on it. And they might be shocked to find out <laughs> that it's actually part of some bill they didn't think they supported at all. Because such as our politically polarized society is, we don't bother to spend the time to actually learn what we don't like. So where possible, avoid labels. Where possible, avoid labels. Yeah, that's very true. You talked about how some of the biggest threats to climate denial wasn't so much that, or one of the drivers of climate denial wasn't so much science denialism, it was more tribalism, fear. That's more of what the issue is rather than disagreement over what the facts or even the solutions might be. Mm -hmm. um, Cameron had a really good question. So I'm actually gonna ask him to come off mute and read his question or say, ask his question to you now. Thanks, Jenna. Dr. Hayho, Ezra Klein of the New York Times poses the question, how do we address climate change if the political system fails to act? Others note how despite the accomplishments of the Paris Agreement in 2015 and the agreements made just months ago in Glasgow, are falling short of emissions targets and political gridlock in the US while tinkering at small improvements as seen in the infrastructure bill is not making a serious dent in our emissions. And so I pose that question towards you. How do we address climate change if the political system fails to act? Mm -hmm. So, so often we assume that the federal the national or the international political system is what has to fix this. And it would be really nice if they would. But in my opinion, they're kind of dragging behind as opposed to being out front. Who's out front? There's some really big companies that are out front. The most encouraging thing for me when I was in Glasgow at COP was seeing all the different groups that were there, talking to representatives from IKEA, Unilever, Nestle, Amazon, Microsoft, who were really serious about cutting their emissions. And their reach is as powerful as that of a mid-sized country. And then the mayors of some of the world's biggest cities, some of the world's biggest cities are bigger than entire countries all by themselves. 
cities are way ahead of the game. Conservative cities, liberal cities, cities in, you know, in, in low-income countries and high-income countries, they are out front on this. We also see universities. We see a lot of indigenous nations and indigenous peoples are out on front. We even see a lot of faith-based groups are out on front. So who's leading the charge? It's not countries leading the charge. It is groups of people who are motivated by a coherent set of values who have decided that they need to advocate for climate action for the reasons that are important to them, which might not be the same reasons that are important to this person or this group, but they're all moving in the same direction together. And so they are dragging the governments along with them. It's not the government's out ahead and everybody following. It's like we, whatever groups we're part of, whatever university, whatever business, whatever church, whatever town, whatever city, whatever state we're part of, we can be getting out ahead and taking the federal government with us. And that's really the way change has happened in the past. And honestly, I'm afraid that's the way change is going to have to happen today. Countries are going to have to get kicks in the seats of their pants, <laughs> so to speak, by the electorate by special interest groups, by their major donors and supporters, by corporations, by, um, you know, <clears throat> faith-based groups and ethics groups and think tanks and everybody, all of us are called to use our voice to advocate for change. And if we assume the federal government's going to take care of it for us, we are going to be very disappointed and we're going to be in dire straits. They are really responders rather than initiators, in my opinion. Now, if you don't mind, I would love to sort of end with um, Dave's question, if that's okay. I think that's a good one to end on. Um, and no, I would I say, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just like, definitely, go ahead. Okay, all right. Um, that there's, there's so many great resources. So don't forget, I'm putting the discussion questions and the videos and the reading list on my website um, as soon as I can. But my poor TA, who was helping with us, she just got COVID too. <laughs> so... And, and yes, we are all vaccinated. We are all boosted. <laughs> it is just ripping through everybody these days. And thank goodness we are, because otherwise I'm sure it'd be a lot worse. So my goal is to get it up by the end of this week. And then I also have global weirding episodes, which answer frequently asked questions, including the question somebody asked about geoengineering. That's there in global weirding. And then um, there's a really great resource that Tammy posted on BioLogos' Integrate curriculum. That is excellent. I helped contribute to it top notch for working with kids. But I think Dave is the question that most people are really wondering these days, which is, where should each of us start first? Where do we start? What do we do? Should we be lobbying or should we be making changes to our personal lives? And my answer to your question, Dave, is yes. <laughs> and what do I mean by that? I mean, we need change at every level. The most important impact that changes in our individual lives have is not on net carbon emissions. It's the impact it has on others around us. So as I talk about in the book, I always adopt two new habits every year. And then I keep the ones from the previous year and I add two the next year after that. But I know that the biggest impact I have is not the impact it has on my personal emissions because they're just a drop in the bucket and no unnoticeable compared to the global average. It's the impact it has on others. So I always, I post on social media, I share what I'm doing with other people, I talk about what I'm doing. And when we talk about it, that's how we start changing our social norms. But I also know that, as you said at the beginning, one of the most important things we as an individual can do right now, to quote Bill McKibben, is not be such an individual. And what that means is we have to engage our climate shadow, not just our carbon footprint. Our carbon footprint is minuscule. Our climate shadow can be huge. What's our climate shadow? It's how we interact with others. It's how we influence people. People in our family, in our neighborhood, in our school, in our children's organizations, in our university, in our church, in our place of work, in our club, in our organization. How we influence others is our shadow. And our shadow makes a huge difference. And how do we engage our shadow? We engage our shadow by acting and by speaking. So whatever we do, whether it is literally changing our light bulbs or lobbying, talk about it. Whether it is you know, asking our university if they can put in charging stations for electric cars, or whether it's putting our money in a bank that invests in climate friendly policies. Do it and talk about it. Engage others, bring others together. And remember that image of us as a body, 
we're not just these individuals that the American dream seems to say that we could somehow survive floating around in outer space all by ourselves, self-sufficient, and that's the goal. No, we are interdependent beings that depend on each other and depend on this planet that we all share. And when we act together, when we engage our shadow to influence others, that is the biggest impact that every single one of us can have as individuals. So that's why my answer to your question is yes. Dr. Hayho, we we thank you so much. This has been like a jolt of encouragement and hope and love. Thank you for sharing with us your time and your resources and your wisdom. Um, can we all just give Dr. Hayho a round of applause? That was phenomenal. From around the country, uh, from the East Coast to the West, we thank you so very much for everything you've brought. Um, to quote a different Catherine, Catherine Wilkinson, it's a magnificent thing to be alive in a moment that matters so much. I hope each of you are reminded of that. And I hope that each of you are reminded of the colleagues and the friends and the fellow advocates that you met this evening. Don't leave tonight empty handed. Go with an email of a new colleague, a plan for next steps, a link from one of the many resources that Dr. Hayho put in the chat and leave with hope for tomorrow. A reminder, if you signed up via Eventbrite, you'll be receiving a brief survey after this event. Be sure to fill that out and give us some feedback about how we can improve for next time. And lastly, on behalf of Jenna, Dr. Hayho and myself and the Climate Witness Project, we thank you for joining us. Um, and we hope that you take care. Go in hope and go in peace.